If you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28 is where we're going to begin, and then we're going to jump back over to 1 John as we look together at the Word of God. I just, uh, it's exciting to see the Lord working in the hearts and lives of His people. And so I trust that you will be blessed as you see uh, our students, these young people, uh, just following the Lord in obedience this morning, uh, making a very loud statement that they know and love Jesus Christ. Last Sunday, we celebrated communion together. We gathered around the Lord's table, and as we ate of the bread, we remembered the perfect life of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we drank of the cup, we remembered the blood that He shed for our sin and the life that we have in Christ. And this morning, as we see this baptism service, we see another powerful picture of the gospel that we proclaim week after week. And so, I want to encourage you to pay close attention uh, as, as these are baptized this morning. They're identifying with Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection and demonstrating the new life that is made possible in Jesus Christ. But let's have a word of prayer this morning and ask the Lord's blessing on our time and we'll get right into the word. Our gracious Heavenly Father, it is truly a privilege to gather in your house this morning and With all that we are, we want to worship you. You alone are worthy of honor and glory and praise. And we have come this morning uh, just to, to worship you, to be in your presence. And Lord, I pray that every single person who is gathered here this morning recognizes that they have come into the presence of the living God. Lord, we do ask that you would speak this morning, that your word would go forth in power. We pray, Father, that... Every heart would be attentive to what you have for us. You have the power to open blinded eyes. You have the power to uh, break hard hearts. But Lord, you also are able to comfort those who are hurting and in need this morning. As we sang earlier, Lord, we bow before your throne to find grace in time of need. And Lord, I, as we gather here this morning uh, in, in the warmth and in the shelter, we think of those who are without. Lord, many... Uh, Lord, this morning still in the Carolinas and now in Florida who are uh, just wading through the devastation, and we pray that you would be with them in a special way. Lord, that we, we ask that you would uh, allow your people, your church, to respond uh, quickly and, 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 Lord, in ways that bring immediate help to those in need. Lord, you are love, and you show your love through your people. And, Father, we pray that that would be evident uh, during these difficult days. As we come this morning, we want to give you honor and glory and praise because there's nothing that is done that you are not a part of. You alone are worthy of that glory. We pray and ask it all in Jesus' name and amen. You know, as excited as we are this morning for these students and these young people who are making this, uh, taking this step of obedience, I always want to make sure that everyone understands fully what is happening. Right? So as as, um, you know, as, these bapti- as these baptisms are taking place, it is most certainly a time to celebrate. Uh, we, we want to join with them. We want to support them. We want to pray for them. But I want to be very clear to everyone here that these baptisms have nothing to do with the individual's salvation. Uh, and, and you may be here and you may say, now wait a minute. Right? This baptism is important. And it is very important. But it does not save. Jesus Christ alone is able to save. And the clear teaching of Scripture again and again and again again is baptism. Belief always precedes baptism. Always. So you always see in the Scripture repentance and faith, right? I understand that I'm a sinner. I see my need of a Savior. I put my trust in Jesus Christ. And then we see people being baptized. So I want to make sure there's a clear understanding for everyone here this morning. Every single one who's being baptized had to sit down with me personally and give their testimony and share a little bit about how they came to know Jesus. We always want to make sure, right, before you get into the water, you need to know this water is not going to save you, right? It, it is a step of obedience. We practice what we call believer's baptism. We believe it is the very first, the first step of obedience for a child of God. Uh, you, you might think, you know, well, if it has nothing to do with salvation, then why in the world do we do it anyway? And the simplest answer is, Jesus told us to. 
That's, that's as, it's as simple as it gets. I had you turn to Matthew 28, familiar section of Scripture. Verse 19 says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus has told us to make other disciples, right? Other people who know and love him, who want to follow him. That's what a disciple is. Someone who has seen and recognized their need and they say, I need Jesus. I'm going to follow him. I want to serve him. And then he says, take those followers and baptize them. So it's a matter of obedience, right? It's an identification with who he is. When you're baptized, you're saying, yes, that's who I am. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I know him. I love him. I want to follow him with my life. And and it's it's exciting, right? It's exciting to see how God is working in the hearts of of, of people. I'm I'm just sitting down and hearing their testimonies. Uh, I I don't want to embarrass her in any way, but this started with just one young lady who said, I want to be baptized. Right. Abby Akers is here, and she, uh, last, last fall, when Sammy Fry was here, made a, made a decision. Right? And, and, and she came and said, I want to be baptized. I said, well, let's do it. And so we put it on the calendar, and suddenly there were other people saying, you know what? I want to take that step of obedience. I want to take that step of obedience. And now, this morning, I think we have 10 who are going to be baptized this morning, and it's just it's incredible to see God working in the hearts of them. And we'll hear some testimony this morning from them as we Uh, as we have those baptisms. But I hope you understand this morning that baptism is a matter of obedience. If you're here this morning and you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you have not been baptized, then you are living in disobedience. And and I understand that there's, there's there's a whole bunch of reasons why that may be true of you. I mean, there's many. But regardless of the reason... The scripture is clear. If you follow Jesus, you are to follow him in baptism, identifying in his death, burial, and resurrection. Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus, my encouragement to you this morning is just to pay very close attention to everything that's going to happen. Because you're going to see a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ that we talk about every single week. The gospel, the good news. The good news that Jesus loved you, that Jesus died for you, that he paid for your sin on the cross. And if you believe that good news, you can experience life, life in Christ, new life, eternal life. (laughs) This is grace gospel, right? We believe it's all of God's grace. And so we want to celebrate that this morning. Now, you're going to hear the language of Matthew 28, 19 over and over as we gather. I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You'll hear me say it every single time. And and I want you to to understand, as we come this morning, we come and worship the triune God. That there is one God existing in three distinct persons. And that sets the God of the Bible apart from all others. There is no God like this God. He is the living God. And we want to exalt Him and glorify Him for all that He is. God the Father. God the Son. We can't even fully wrap our minds around that truth. And yet we believe it with everything we are. We've been looking at John's letter, so if you want to turn with me over there, you can. 1 John chapter 4. We're going to look at that passage that we looked at for our scripture meditation this morning. And it is perfect for our baptismal service. We're going to see all three persons of the Trinity in action as we look at 1 John together. John has been giving us a a look uh, at what true, genuine, saving faith looks like. So last week, we saw that that evidence centered around the love that his people have. His people have primarily for one another, but... It's a divine love that is shed abroad in the hearts of his people. We said this, Jesus' people are to love like he loved. It should be evident if you know Jesus and you follow Jesus that his love is is exemplified in your life. And so the, the opposite is true, right? If you have no love for others and you have no love for God, then there's a good possibility that you're not a follower of Christ. His whole purpose here is just kind of 
weighing out, right? Assuring the hearts of those who are truly saved and then rooting out the fakes who are professors but not genuine possessors. And make no mistake, that's very possible to be true of you this morning. You may very well be someone who says, yes, I'm a Christian, yes, I'm saved, I'm good, but you're just merely professing, but you don't actually possess the life that is possible in Christ. Right? And that's what, that's what John's letter here is all about. Right? It's all about showing, right? What does it look like to truly know Jesus? Can I know that I have eternal life? Can I know for certain that I'm saved? And the answer, according to John, is yes, you can know. You can be sure. You can have assurance. You can be confident. We see it in verse 13. By this we know. We know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. We know. We can be confident. What do we know? That he is in us and that we are in him. That's salvation language. Right? That's what it means to, to, to come and to receive Jesus Christ means that he is in us. Right? And that we are in him and we are secure. That's what it means to be saved, to be in Christ. And so how do we know that we are in Christ? By his spirit. By his Holy Spirit. So if you have been indwelt with his spirit, if you have been filled with his spirit, if you show evidence of the fruit of the spirit in your life, then you can know, you can be sure, you can be certain that you are saved. Because you see the realities of the Spirit in your life. And some of you are going, wow, what does that look like? That seems really subjective. You know, I don't feel the Holy Spirit. I don't see the Holy Spirit. And you know, if, if we're just going on emotions and feelings, then you know, there's lots of days where you may not feel the Spirit of God. But we should see evidence of His Spirit in our life. Right? The fruit of the Spirit, visible evidence is what? Love. Joy. Peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. How do I know that I have the Spirit of God in me? Because I see evidence of His Spirit. You know, that evidence plays out in many ways, and we'll look at a few here this morning. And some of you are probably thinking, what in the world does this have to do with baptism? <laughs> a lot. Right? This is a powerful picture of what takes place when a person comes to saving faith. So, see, when, when baptism... When baptism takes place, what we have is a physical analogy of a spiritual reality. Right? So what happens physically up here, as I take that person down into the water and I bring them up out of the water, is meant to paint a picture for you of what happens when a person puts their trust in Jesus Christ. Right? So every single person who has been saved, who has put their trust in Jesus, they have been immersed into him. They've been immersed into Christ. That's what that word baptism means. It means immerse. It means to dunk. It means, literally, it means to drown. <laughs> right? So you have been, when you are saved, you have been immersed in Christ. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives where? In me. <laughs> in the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So you see, right? This, this picture is, is pointing to what happens in salvation. When you go down into the water, you are, it's as if when Jesus died, you died, right? That old life, you were dead, and, and you died with Christ, and you were buried with Christ, but then when you come back up out of the water, when Jesus lived, you live. You experience this new life in Christ. <laughs> we have these reminders here of what Jesus has done this morning. Jump back to verse 9 with me of chapter 4. Right. <laughs> we saw this last week, but I just want to point it out again. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. This is how we see the love of God. That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Right? We had no life apart from Christ. You say, I'm alive and kicking. What are you talking about? We were dead spiritually in our sin. 
No life, no way of, of getting to God, no way of pleasing God. We were dead, but God sent his son so we might have life. And then in verse 10, he says, and this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Right? It's not that we love God or we sought God out. It's that he loved us and he sought us out and he sent his son and he sent his son to be the propitiation. And some of you are going, I don't know what that means. And that's okay. It just means that God, God's wrath towards our sin was satisfied in Christ. See, God in his holiness is going to judge sin. And he did judge sin on the cross when he poured out his full wrath on Jesus. And so, again, no sense in which this baptism this morning saves you. But it paints a picture. As you go down into the water, there's a picture of the cleansing that takes place when you come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Apart from Jesus, not only are you dead in your sin, but you are sinful. Right? And you, you are dirty and filthy and stained by the wickedness and the sin and the evil of the world. And when you come to faith in Jesus and you call on him to save you, he cleanses you fully. Every sin, past, present, future, paid for on the cross. You, you might be here this morning and you might feel dirty and filthy and you might feel as if you have no right being in the house of God. But dear friend, Jesus Christ can forgive you. He can cleanse you. And you see a picture of that as they go down into the water and they come back up. Not an actual cleansing, right? But a picture of the cleansing that takes place in Christ. All of it is meant to point to that reality. There's another one we see here in our passage this morning. Right? It says we know, we know that we abide in him because he has given us his spirit. When you come to saving faith in Jesus Christ, the spirit of God literally indwells you. Right? That he takes up residence in you. You say, what are you talking about? Acts 1.5 says this. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. See, one of the things that's going to be pictured this morning as they're immersed down into the water is their, the immersion of the Spirit. That God's Spirit literally indwells us, fills us, takes up residence in our life. If I wanted to... If I wanted to carry the analogy out perfectly, when I take them under the water this morning, some of you are going to freak out, right? Don't freak out. I would open their mouth and, and, and just allow the water just to fill and flood their body until it's overflowing. All right, so I'm not going to do that, okay? <laughs> Brady's watching me close. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. But that's, that's what the analogy would right? The Spirit of God comes in and fills and overflows you and so that now there's evidence in your life that you're a follower of Christ because His Spirit is in you. This is what is pictured this morning. So it's, it's a powerful picture, but it's also a public proclamation. It's meant to say, yes, I know Him. Yes, I love Him. We see it in verse 14. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. The we here is the, the apostles. Those who saw Jesus, literally walked with Jesus. Right? Those, they, they saw. They saw His life. They saw Him as He went to the cross. They saw the tomb where He was buried. But they also saw Jesus following His resurrection. They saw Him ascend up into the heavens. They saw it all. Back in 1 John chapter 1, John wrote this, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. In verse 3, he says, That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. You see what he's saying? This is eyewitness testimony that we're giving you. We're saying, I saw him. I heard him. I touched him. These are not stories. These are not myths. This is someone saying, I saw Jesus. And he is everything he said he was. 
He is the Savior of the world. You see, when you've experienced Jesus Christ for yourself, that's what you want people to know. You want people to know. I've seen Jesus. I've experienced Jesus. And I want you to know he can do exactly what he said he would do. He's the Savior, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's what John's communicating. And I know, right, we haven't actually seen Jesus with our eyes, but we have experienced the power of his salvation in our lives. And we want others to know, right? He saved me. He can save you too. And that's what this baptism is all about. It's about publicly proclaiming, giving a, 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 a witness to everyone that, yes, he is exactly who he says. I know it. I've experienced it. And I want you to know that I've experienced it. Right? Verse 13, or 15, I'm sorry. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, abide, God abides in him and he in God. The one who confesses. That's what we're doing this morning, right? We're, we're saying, yes, I know Jesus. Yes, he is God. He is the Son of God sent into the world to save me. And yes, he is my Savior. He is my Lord. And, and the one who makes that confession, he is the one who can be assured of their salvation. How do you know that you have the Spirit of God dwelling in you? Because you have believed in Jesus. You understand it's impossible to believe in Jesus apart from the Spirit? I'm not talking about an intellectual knowledge. I'm not talking about a profession that you say, yes, Jesus is Lord. But 1 Corinthians 12, 3 says it's impossible. It's impossible to say that Jesus is Lord apart from the Spirit. There's this moment where, where Peter is with the disciples and, and he, he says what? Behold the Lamb of God, right? That's John, right? Peter says, right, this is the Christ. The, the son of the living God. And, and Jesus says, my father in heaven has revealed that to you. There's no way that we can see Jesus for who he is apart from his spirit. So how do I know that I have the spirit in me? Because I believe in Jesus. Now, the idea of confessing here is powerful. It's in the aorist tense in the Greek. And some of you are going, I don't care what the Greek says. And that's okay. But it just means this. There was a point in time where you believed and this belief was one that was settled. It was sure. It was, it was one in which would be the state of your life forever and ever and ever. Right? That's the idea here. A lifetime confession. And this is what we should expect from every single believer. Every single person who has put their trust in Jesus. They're saying, yes, I affirm. I believe. I confess that Jesus is God, he is Lord, and he is my Savior. And you're accepting, you're believing all that the Bible says about who he is and what he has done. Right? Matthew 10, 32 says this. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. You see, this confession is significant. It's important. If you're unwilling, if you're ashamed, or you're unwilling to believe and willing to acknowledge Jesus for who he is, the Bible says one day that he will say, I do not know you. When you, when you die, when you take your last breath, when you see him face to face, he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. This confession is vital that we affirm, that we acknowledge. So when a person is baptized, they're making a very loud and bold statement to the world that they're a new person in Christ and that Jesus is now Lord of their life. It's a lot like, it's a lot like putting on a wedding ring. Right? I know most of them getting baptized are too young to get married. But when I got married, I stood actually in this sanctuary. Right? I stood beside my wife, and I made a, a covenant. I made a promise, right? I'm going to love you, right, till death do us part. And during that service, I took a ring, and I put it on my finger. And that ring signifies 
that I belong to her. And she has one that signifies that she belongs to me. Right? And everybody knows that, right? There's a visible symbol that says, he is married, she is married, right? And so everybody knows that. So when you're baptized, you're making a public proclamation, a visible representation of what happens. You're saying, I belong to Jesus. <laughs> I'm his. That's the statement that these young people are coming to make this morning. And it's the very thing that you and I should desire with our life every single day. Every day of our life, we want to be a faithful witness, a faithful testimony saying, yes, I know, I love Jesus. And you, you need him too. That's what this is about this morning, a public proclamation. And the last thing, very quickly, is, I would say, a passionate pursuit. A passionate pursuit. We see it in verse 16. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. We have come to know. We have come to believe. And this is in the perfect tense, which means it was a past action with continuing results. There's a time where you came to know the love of God where you came to believe in the Son of God. And that past action now, it has results in your life. There's an effect in your life. So because you've experienced God's love for yourself, you now have a passion to, to show that love to others. Because what? We know God's love. We believe God's love. And in turn, we now reflect God's love. If you want to see the pattern of this passage, Right? He, he sent his spirit in verse 13. In verses 14 and 15, he sent his son. And now in verse 16, he sends us. He sends us. He abides in us. He dwells in us. And now we have been sent out into the world to reflect the very love that he has shown to us. We've experienced God's love in such a dramatic way. We looked at this more closely last week, so I don't want to rehash anything. But God loved us when we were unlovable. He, he saved us when we didn't deserve to be saved. And, and now he's sending us out into the world. And how does he want us to love? He wants us to love those who are unlovable. He wants us to show care and concern for those who don't deserve it. You and I didn't. And that, man, that plays out in our life day after day because we're going to, we mentioned this last week, we're, we're going to live with people, right? There's people in our home who are hard to live with. And you're going to work with people who are hard to work with. And there's going to be people in your community and in your school and in different areas that are difficult people. And Jesus called you as his follower to go out and love them in countless ways, sacrificial ways, selfless ways ways I mentioned this old hymn many times it's so often you probably get tired of it but I don't when I survey the wondrous cross right the hymn writer is just saying when I see what love displayed on the cross he concludes with this line love so amazing so divine demands my soul my life my all if you've experienced the love that God has shown you, it's a demanding love. It demands allegiance. It demands obedience. It demands that we follow him. So we abide in God, and God abides in us. So that verse 12 says, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. You see the picture? People, people don't see God with their eyes, but you know what they do see? They should see God's love through you and me. He sent us into the world for this purpose. He's in you. And if he is in you, then his love should be in you. That thought alone should transform us. God in me. God in me. If it's true 
that the Spirit of God dwells in us, there should be something different about us than people who do not have the Spirit of God. Isn't that right? Shouldn't that be true? I mean, I've used this analogy before. I actually, we talked about our elder meeting yesterday, but if, if I like basketball. If I said, I'm going to go out on the court, but today, the spirit of Michael Jordan is in me. You would expect my game to, to, to go to a different level, right? You would expect me to be a better ball player than I was without the spirit of Michael Jordan. I know it's a silly analogy, but you know what? If we have God, the spirit of God in us, then we should expect there to be a difference. We should expect the level to, of love to be different than those who do not know him and do not have his spirit. How do I know that I have the spirit of God in me? How do I know? How can I be confident? Well, number one, do you believe? Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? That's evidence of God's spirit. If you say, yes, I have seen my sin and I've called on Jesus to save me, then there's evidence there of the spirit of God at work in your life. Do you have a desire to obey him and to follow him in obedience? That's what these students are doing this morning. They're saying, I want to take that step of obedience in my walk with Christ. Right? Do you see evidence of the fruit of the spirit in your life? Do you see the power of God at work in your life? Jesus came to be the Savior of the world. Is he your Savior? Is he your Savior? Do you know him? Have you trusted his life-giving, wrath-absorbing death on the cross? Has there been a time where you called on him to rescue you from your sin? Most important thing you could, you could do this morning if you do not know Jesus is to just fall before his throne and, and plead with him to save you. Say, so I don't know what that looks like. All it looks like is just calling, calling out to you. God, I know I'm not right. I know my life is not what it should be. But I believe that you love me, and I believe you sent Jesus to save me, and that's what I need. Would you forgive me of my sin? But if you do that today, my, my prayer, my plea is that you would talk to someone. Talk to a family member, talk to a friend, come talk to me. I'd love to know, I'd love to know that you have put your trust in Jesus and help you on your walk with him. In fact, I'd love to talk to you a little more and we could have another baptism here in a month. This should be what we see ongoing in the life of the church as we make disciples who are then baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who then go and make disciples who will be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is why the church exists, that we are a public testimony to the good news of the gospel. Dear friend, have you identified with him in believer's baptism? You say, yes, I'm a Christian. Yes, I know. But have you been baptized? Have you taken that step of obedience? If not, why not? What's holding you back? And if so, if you're here this morning, I know that reflects the life of many of you. If you have been baptized, then does that reality, is it reflected in your life? Do you see evidence of the Spirit at work in your life? If not, then there's another, right? I mean, as followers of Him, we've got to just say, you know what, Lord, I'm not living the life that I should live. As, as a follower, I'm not loving the way I should love. There's some areas that I need, to, I need to do better in. I need your help because I can't do it on my own. We're going to close in prayer. And in just a moment, we're going to have those come forward who are going to be baptized. And again, it's a picture of the, the, the realities of the gospel. And I trust you'll see that. Let's pray.